Welcome. Um, it, it's a pleasure to, to be here. I'm the CEO of Anti-Slavery International. My name's Jasmine O'Connor, and I'm joined uh, by my colleague, Claire Shakaya, who is the Director of Climate Change at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here and to be welcoming friends and colleagues and hopefully some newcomers from um, uh, far and wide to discuss the issue of climate-induced migration and modern slavery and indeed to be able to share with you the findings of the new report that we are launching today. So welcome, if you are joining us, do pop in the chat, uh, you know, say hello, say where you're from, uh, let us know um, how you're feeling today, and maybe even why you why you found this uh, subject interesting and want to join us. We've got a brilliant lineup of speakers and panelists to take us through the findings, and myself and Claire will be tag teaming as co-chairs throughout throughout this event. I'll hand over to Claire in, in just a second, but just to say a very brief word about Anti-Slavery International. We've been working to end slavery in all its forms around the world for 181 years. And this groundbreaking research that we've participated on with IIED um, is, is, is I guess just an evolution of that journey in trying to understand some of the systemic causes of slavery so that we can tackle them uh, at their root. And indeed the groundbreaking research that we're launching today is clear that climate change is both an ecological and a human disaster that can lead to modern slavery. And the partnership with IAED, I just wanna say a word about that because you know, we're bringing 181 years experience of ending slavery. They're bringing 50 years uh, environmental experience at the, at the forefront of um, campaigning for action on climate. And so together, we really hope to further this debate. So welcome to you all. I'm glad to see you here. And I hope that together we can consider the action that we all need to take in the run up to COP. I'll now hand over to Claire to uh, kick us off with the uh, with the show. Claire. Thanks so much, Jasmine, and so happy to be here. Welcome to everyone also from our side. Um, and um, we're really hoping that today will be a, an interactive session. So please do use um, the chat to put um, down your questions and we'll pick them up and uh, and seek to address them at the end of the pan at the end of the, um, the session and the panel. Um, so first with them, um, I feel that we should get on with our speakers. Um, there's a lot to talk about today. So I'm delighted to introduce our first keynote speaker, Philippe Gonzalez Morales. Um, Felipe was appointed by the Human Rights Council in June 2017 as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants. So delighted you can join us today, Felipe. Thanks for the invitation to this event to launch the report decoding the nexus between climate change, migration and modern slavery. I highly appreciate this initiative to call on the attention about this issue from Anti-Slavery International and the International Institute for Environmental and, and, and Development. As the report points out, there are several emerging pathways of the links between climate change, migration and modern slavery. Migrants are particularly vulnerable to modern slavery and climate-induced migration places migrants at, the particular, at a particular risk of becoming victims of more forms of slavery. The main problem in establishing a definition of climate migration lies in the monocausality that, that is presupposed, as it is not simple to isolate the environmental and climate factor from the political, economic, demographic and social factors that pre-exist and that together determine the form and quality of life. It is usual that the episodes of environmental degradation will have an incidence in the country, consequences that will depend on the infrastructural, socioeconomic and political conditions. This in the same way that states in crisis usually have many political, economic and environmental migrants, and it is often difficult to clearly distinguish one cause from another. Causes of migration are often multifactorial so that they interact successfully, successfully or simultaneously. 
Climatic migrations can be associated both to the lack of job options in agriculture or to the uncertainty of harvest times due to rains or droughts, as well as those directly related to climate change or worsening environmental conditions, either gradually or leading to an extreme degradation. Therefore, it is not so obvious to distinguish what we call traditional migration from climate migration, because it is usual that people who are forced to move because of environmental degradation do not, do not refer to it when they explain their reasons for migrating. They tend to emphasize the socioeconomic reasons, despite the fact that poverty and unemployment may be caused by environmental degradation, and that is why for the study of environmental migrations, a broad analysis is required, one in which the interactions of various factors are taken into account. The debate on climate change and migration must be a driving force that will lead a better consideration of the rights of migrants in the different categories, avoiding a rigid distinction of specific causes that singularize each one. In this sense, policies must be formulated to strengthen the protection of human rights for people who are forced to leave their place of origin. One of the most evident examples of the interaction between political and environmental causes is war. Due to the use of weapons such as napalm or herbicides like Agent Orange during the Vietnam War or the Black Rain provoked in the Gulf Wars, these types of weapons made the places where they were used and their surroundings unavitable, provoking the movement of the population. On the other hand, environmental degradation will increase the wars for access to increasingly scarce resources, such as those already known for wars over oil or diamonds. Throughout the 21st century, water wars are expected to become a growing phenomenon as water resources are increasingly exploited and contaminated. Environmental migrations caused by tidal waves, volcanoes, and earthquakes do not have a direct origin in human intervention, but their effects do depend on their management both before and after the event. They can influence measures for the recovery of the stated areas and to ensure that displaced migrants do not stay in refugee camps with unworthy living conditions for a long time or even permanently, as after the tsunami in the Indian Ocean in 2004. Despite the increasing number of these unpredictable events given the global ecological crisis, most environmental migrants flee as a result of anthropic environmental impacts or environmental mismanagement that interact with natural phenomena, causing displacement by the rising sea levels and hurricanes, droughts and fruits, degraced drinking water or desertification, whose human and material damage could be reduced with good management. In general terms, acting preemptively is much less costly in both human and economic terms, which is why good planning seems a relevant way to deal successfully with situations like this. The causes of climate uh, change in their various forms are already factors that affect the lives of a large number of people, forcing them to seek a new place to live. And although this is a phenomenon already underway, there are still important variables that depend on political decisions. The dispossession of the natural means of survival constitute a cause of displacement for millions of people. It can include diverse reasons, such as the implantation of large infrastructures like dams or reservoirs, tourist zones, transnational companies that settle their industrial facilities in poorest countries, material extraction or intensive cultivation. Frequently, these events lead to the eviction of populations that have occupied and cared for these lands since immemorial times without titles of possession. They are also forced to abandon these lands due to the sudden increase of contamination levels and generation of toxic waste, which caused a gradual departure. This modification of land use brings it forced relocations that pose many problems for affected populations. It is important not to neglect that in this context of migratory movements due to global climate change, there are factors that restrict mobility. For example, the trapped populations, which are the populations that lack the resources to leave the danger zone, despite environmental deterioration and imminent threat, will be forced to stay. 
Another factor causing the increase of trapped populations is the closing of borders and the increase of border security. It is a reality for many, many populations, such as those in the Sahel region, affected by desertification and changes in rainfall patterns. Similarly, migration forecasts are always marked by a deterministic bias that presupposes that the entire population at risk will move. As the report being launched today rightly points out, climate and development policymakers and planners urgently need to recognize that millions of people displaced by climate change are being and will be exposed to slavery in the coming decades. Recognizing slavery as a mainstream policy issue alongside poverty and climate change will help to develop understanding of the underlying drivers that push disadvantaged communities into slavery. I congratulate again the organizations which produced this timely and important report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Felipe. Um, it's it's a pleasure to have, have heard your opening remarks, and I think it really sets the, the, the tone very well for us to begin to unpack the report. Um, but I'd love to turn now to um, Cecilia Silva Bernardo, who is our second keynote speaker. Now, Cecilia is the climate negotiator for Angola and for the least developed countries and co-chair of the Adaptation Committee of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And as such, she's a strong advocate for um, least developed country leadership on climate adaptation and an important critical voice on finance for adaptation and so really um, there's 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 a there's a great um, amount riding on on your words I think um, Cecilia and as we approach COP uh, I'm, I'm delighted to to have you here um, looking at this report, understanding this report, and being able to share your thoughts, and indeed, hopefully, take some of those um, perspectives uh, forward into the negotiations. So, Cecilia, you're most welcome. Uh, do please share your thoughts with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine, um, for the wonderful words. Um, good day, uh, dear all. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Anti-Slavery International and IAED for the invitation to be part of this important uh, dialogue. Uh, colleagues, uh, uh, we may recall that in uh, 1990, the IPCC noted that the greatest single impact of climate change could be on human migration. With millions of people displaced by uh, shoreline erosion, cost of loading and agricultural disruption. Since then, various analysts have tried to put members on future flows of climate migrants, sometimes also referred to as climate refugees. The most recent assessment by the World Bank Ground 12 report put the number as 216 million people by 2050, with the most vulnerable regions being Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia and Pacific, South Asia and North Africa, also one of the poorest region of the world. Despite those numbers, the international policy discourse is still debating about the causal link between climate change and migration. While uh, we are still struggling with the development deficit in LDCs, we were hit by climate impacts that has impacted our ability to deal with poverty and marginalization. Climate is now acting as a stress multiplier to all the factors that were already driving vulnerability while adaptation measures continue to be critical for addressing climate impacts. The problem is one of time, which means because of the speed of climate change and scale, which means the number of people it, it, uh, it is affecting. So the simplistic image of a coastal household, depending on sub, sub, subsistence farming, being forced to pack up their bags and move to a rich country does not happen in real world. On the contrary, as, is already, as it is already the case with political refugees, it is likely that the burden of providing for climate migrants will be burned by the poorest countries and communities, those least responsible for climate impacts. They are left to fend for themselves 
exposed to issues of exploitation, often leading communities in slavery and slavery-like situations. This climate-induced distress, migration, and displacement is hindering the development of the society and community in LDCs by increasing pressure of urban infrastructure and services, by undermining economic growth, by increasing the risk of conflict, and by leading to worse health, educational, and social indicators among migrants. And in this stressed situation with no other option left, they are either forced to undertake dangerous coping strategies that expose them to slavery or place them at the mercy of traffickers at refugee camps. Here again, I will reiterate that the people who are exposed to these consequences of climate impacts were not responsible for causing them. Furthermore, the developed countries are struggling of their responsibility. So far, they have not even met their commitment of 100 billion target for climate finance support. Let uh, alone the fact that a very minuscule amount of what they are providing as climate finance is available for climate adaptation that can help the communities better prepare or cope with climate impacts. So far, there is no home for climate migrants in the international community, both literally and figuratively. There has been a collective and rather successful attempt to ignore the scale of, prob of the problem. Forced climate displacements fall through the cracks. Well, I'm happy to see this issue finally is getting recognized here and we are discussing today this issue. So based on current climate change scenarios, a certain amount of forced climate migration is locked in but how much depends on the international community support for adaptation. It is clear that the international community has to face up to a prospect of large-scale displacement caused by climate change. There is a need for international recognition of the problem, a better understanding of its, its dimensions and a willingness to tackle it is also necessary. As a voice of LDC country, I feel there is a need for the international community to firstly acknowledge formally the predicament of forced climate migrants and the vulnerabilities and risks of slavery they are exposed to, and secondly, extend financial, technical, and policy support for development of uh, and adaptation. <coughs> sorry, effort in LDCs for forced climate migrants to reduce people's vulnerability to climate change, moving people away from marginal areas and supporting livelihoods that are more resilient so that they are not exposed to issues like trafficking and slavery. In the end, I will say that we can no longer close our eyes to the plight of the climate-induced migration and displacement and wish for it to go away or close our boundaries to them. There are human lives we are talking about and the international climate discourse needs to recognize and act on this issue. I thank you again, Jasmine, for the opportunity to speak uh, here in this very important uh, dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, I think you've, you've set out the, the, the human challenge very, very clearly, and it's a compelling, it's a compelling case. Um, I would love to thank both of the keynote speakers now and um, begin to introduce our, our panel. But before I do that, I'd like to just spend a moment or two just to share a little bit from Anti-Slavery International's perspective and also to invite Claire to share a little bit from IIED's perspective as to why this is such important um, research for, for us both as, as organisations and also as individuals, because I know that Claire and myself are, are, are passionate advocates for, for these issues. Um, so really, you know, I think it starts from anti-slavery's perspective with the fact that there are currently 41 million people in slavery. And we know from our experience that when a person is controlled and exploited for personal or commercial gain, the drivers are often complex and multifaceted. Um, it could be discrimination, it could be weak rules of law, it could be 
um, poor enforcement of laws or indeed poverty, they all play a role um, in, in actually creating the kind of conditions that 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 sort of push people to to uh, slavery and indeed um, to allow traffickers to to trick and entrap people who who don't have their basic human rights and needs met. And indeed, COVID, as we know, has exacerbated many, many of these factors. Um, but this research tells us how climate change is adding a multiplier effect on top of these existing conditions that drive slavery, um, a domino effect that displaces people both internally and across borders and increases their vulnerability to slavery. Um, the World Bank estimates that by 2050, climate change will have forced more than 143 million people in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia and Latin America from their homes. Now add that vulnerability of 143 million people to the 41 million people who are currently enslaved and understand that this is a human disaster beyond anything we've, we've ever seen. The Sustainable Development Goal 8.7 focuses on ending forced labour, modern slavery and human trafficking, as well as the worst forms of, of child labour. And if we don't take bold action to understand and to uh, ameliorate the conditions that are being created by a climate crisis and climate impacts, there is no way that we're going to come anywhere close to ending um, uh, those, those forms of slavery and indeed uh, reaching the Sustainable Development Goal 8.7. So unless we really take serious action, the progress that has been made on ending slavery to date is going to go you know, into reverse. Um, and indeed, the climate crisis will create a problem, a challenge that moves beyond borders, um, creates a, uh, in a sense, a sort of ticking time bomb of slavery in the making. And so, you know, we thought that we needed to understand more about these interactions so that we were able to be in a position to, you know, add our voice to those calling for um, bold action to get to net zero, um, and to make sure that we understand how we can uh, address these, these impacts for some of the most marginalised people in the world. So from my perspective, this is a timely report and is absolutely critical in our 181 year fight to end slavery, where we seek to get systemic change and not just uh, move, move the sort of bits and pieces around, but we go for the, the big issues. And this is, this is by far um, the biggest issue, certainly, that I know I will see, or I hope I will see in, in, my, in my lifetime. So Claire, we'd, we'd love to get your perspective from IIED as to why you found this um, such an important piece of research to undertake. Thanks so much, Jasmine. And yes, absolutely. I think I think it really is. Um, the international community is recognising that environmental degradation and climate change um, can result in population displacement and can do so at really fast rates, as we've heard from um, our keynote speakers. Um, and the issue is, as you say, Jasmine, we're just not equipped to address this issue effectively currently. Um, we don't have an adequate framework for policy planning and responses. And leaving this issue unattended could have dangerous consequences for the poorest and most marginalised at risk of trafficking and, various, and from the various forms of slavery. Um, to date, where we have seen action on climate-induced migration, it's been largely reactive, responding to humanitarian crises in developing countries after a disaster strikes. And in the absence of preventative measures, the future of many vulnerable communities, and particularly in the poorest countries, the LDCs, as Cecilia was speaking to, are likely to continue to see these issues become more intangible. So what we, what we see is land de degradation or drought leads to food insecurity, which in turn is leading to people needing to move, needing to find jobs elsewhere. And, um, and in that movement, they're being exposed um, to the risks of modern slavery. Um, and because policymakers are seeing migration and relocation as the sort of last resort options, they're often not thinking about how the, um, to respond, how to help, how to make it safer. 
Um, but with climate change, we're going to see more, not less families on the move, individuals on the move. So we need to start planning preemptively and put in place the support mechanisms um, needed to for rehabilitation, to support them to recover from um, having to move, but also to help them um, shift into new sustainable livelihoods um, where they are or in new locations. And these relocation programs can't be quick fix options. They need We need to start thinking now about how to attract people into safer locations in, and help them move safely and then provide support to strengthen their livelihoods, build resilience, improve their living standards and restore the local environment, invigorate the local community. They need to be an asset where they arrive. And proactive intervention is now essential. Um, at IID, with our um, work on loss and damage, we're co-developing solutions with vulnerable country representatives, exploring how early action um, for relocation can be used as adaptation um, or a risk minimization strategy. And that can be through government planned relocation to move households out of harm's way. It could be government driven relocation after disaster, or it could be through supporting voluntary migration by households or individuals. And we do have some good examples already. Um, one is the Danish Refugee Council's programme in Burundi, which is a resilience um, project aimed at enhancing livelihoods, increasing food security and building climate resilience. But the, what's special about it is the community is made up of internally displaced people and the host community. Um, and another example is the Uruguay National Re Resettlement Plan, which has been considered a lighthouse in these types of approaches. And they're planning to relocate thousands of households, focusing on families that live in extreme poverty, out of flat pro flood prone areas and into secure housing. So at IID, we're, we're working hard with our partners to, to um, secure fair and equitable solutions to climate change. And we work hand in hand with the progressive countries looking to act early and particularly the least developed countries to find these solutions. The issue of climate change induced migration and displacement and its nexus with slavery is high on our agenda and we'll continue to raise this issue at, at policy fora and amplify the evidence and voices of those with lived experience. So thank you Jasmine, that, that's where we are on, um, on, on why we see this as an important issue. Fantastic. And it reminds me of why this is such a dynamic partnership. We're, we're on the same page. Fantastic. Um, so look, without further ado, I'd love to just introduce our panellists and we can kick off with some uh, questions to them from myself and Claire, which will begin to unpack the findings of the research. So first up is uh, Rita Barahadwaj, I'm sorry, or, uh, Senior Researcher, Climate Change Group, International Institute for Environment and Development from IIED. I'm sorry, I massacred your last name. I, I apologize sincerely, Rita. I've been talking to you all week um, and I hadn't even looked at your uh, last name until just now, but it's a pleasure to have you with us and Rita has, has absolutely kind of been a leading light in this research, um, driving it forward and uh, making it what it is today. Um, uh, Somnath Hazra, consultant, economist and visiting uh, faculty um, uh, from West Bengal, India. Um, it's a fantastic pleasure to have you uh, with us, Somnath, and um, you're most welcome. Uh, James Kofi Annan, who's president of Challenging Heights in Ghana, civil society partner that we've been uh, working with throughout this work and indeed um, have engaged on some other pieces. Um, Enoch, Enoch Pufa, senior manager, impact and strategic relationships, Challenging Heights Ghana. Um, great to see you as well. And um, Fran Witt, last but no least, um, our very own Anti-Slavery International Climate Change and Modern Slavery Advisor. It's wonderful to have you all here. I hope you can hear me and um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you've all got to say. Um, but starting with, with you, Ritu, I, you know, I, I know that you've you've led this research, that you've driven it forward, and you've been immersed in the in the findings for quite some time now, pulling it all out, helping us to 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 sort of make sense of it. So, really, first up, what links did you observe between climate change, migration, and modern slavery? Tell us about it. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Uh, very good question. Uh, actually, I'll have a blast responding to that question. 
So our research and evidence indicated that the relation or the nexus that exists between climate change, migration, and severe forms of exploitation that we term as slavery exists along three pathways or three circumstances. Uh, firstly, in context of sudden or extreme climatic events, for example, cyclones or floods or hurricanes, which leads to displacement of communities. Now, this first pathway is, I would say, most well documented. Very strong evidence exists to show that this nexus exists between under these circumstances. Um, and, and especially indicating that human trafficking increases in the aftermath of such extreme events. Now, for example, many survivors in the wake of Typhoon Haiya in Philippines found themselves with no viable alternative or in turn were coerced into working as prostitutes or laborers. Uh, there are many more examples like this, and I can go on. For example, in Bangladesh, women left widowed by Cyclone Sidr were targeted by traffickers and driven into prostitution and hard labor. And similarly, from my own country uh, in, in India, in northeastern India, Assam, women and girls are forced into child slavery and forced marriages to make ends meet. So this is the first pathway indicating the nexus in the aftermath of a sudden or extreme uh, climate event. Now the second pathway or sec second situation where this nexus was seen to exist was in the event of a slow onset disaster like a drought, desertification, salination and so on. Now, this pathway exists when climate variability, uh, such as increasingly higher than normal temperatures or erratic rainfall, leads to drought-like situations, resulting in crop or pasture loss, drinking water shortage or food insecurity. And in situations like these, uh, it pushes communities dependent on natural resources for their livelihoods to look for alternate sources of subsistence. Now, and this happens in absence of any other viable local option. And that's why we need policy support. Uh, and these communities are left to fend for themselves and they're often pushed into dangerous or risky migration opportunities or incurring debt. Now, the research um, in the BRICS sector in Cambodia, which is also known as blood BRICS, maps this intricate detail of how farmers whose livelihood had been undermined by climate change were forced into intergeneration bondage by kiln factory owners who would often buy their debt and then force them into working in subhuman conditions that had absolutely no control over their rights, decision making, and so on. And the third pathway, the third situation where we saw this nexus existing uh, was shown to exist when slow onset event, like the one that I just talked about, uh, is combined with conflict or forced displacement. Now, this final pathway normally exists when a large-scale incremental forced displacement due to conflict is precipitated by slow onset natural disasters such as drought leading to famine-like situation. Now, typically, conflicts weaken institutions, uh, local institutions, markets, or livelihood support systems that communities have. And it is, and since countries are in conflict-like situation, they are not able to provide community with the means to adapt or cope with climate shocks or stresses. Now, the resulting income loss, displacement, or high level of food insecurity forces community again to pursue risky coping strategies that lands them into bondage, slavery-like situation. Now, all the three situations or the three pathways that I just talked about, they're not standalone. They, they quite often they overlap and they intersect with each other. Even the third pathway, which clearly overlaps with the second pathway that I talked about. And in each of these circumstances, similar dynamics to vulnerability to modern slavery exist. For example, enhanced marginalization, inequity, poverty, which are drivers of uh, modern slavery, I would say. And when climate change impacts them, then it exacerbates all that. So in conclusion, I would say that Climate change is, is like a stress multiplier, placing people who are already in precarious situations in positions where they reach the limits of coping capacity and then exposed to slavery. And second, and very important point to note here, uh, and especially for the policymakers, is the links between climate change, migration, and modern slavery. It's rooted in power balances within the society. 
uh, and vulnerability to climate induced migration is evident most in those who are already marginalized uh, by either gender, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status. And there are um, team, if you look at our uh, research document, there are so many evidences which have shown that women, girls who are already marginalized, they were more exposed to slavery or slavery-like situation when, clam when they were exposed to climate change. And, and also, as I kept talking about policymakers, yep, the role of policymakers is very, very important because lack of priority and recognition to this issue is resulting in absence of strong policy environment where workers and migrants write abuse. It, it, everyone knows that it exists, but it largely remains unregulated and they are disregarded quite often, especially as at an expense of achieving rapid economic growth and infrastructure development. So in many places, you know, in order to achieve that rapid infrastructure growth, whether it's through brick sector or through rapid industrialization, urbanization, they turn a blind eye uh, to the plight of the workers, the, the exploitation that they're subjected to. So I'll stop there, Jasmine, and going back to you. Thanks so much, Ritu. That was, that was fascinating. Um, so I guess um, I'd be interested to hear from you, Somnath, um, in your experience in um, uh, the Sundarbans, um, which obviously cut across both India and Bangladesh, um, what have what what those issues have come up there? And did it differ between India and um, Bangladesh? Yeah, uh, very good question, Claire. Uh, I must say that um, it's a very good question for the uh, Indian Sundarban Delta as well as the Bangladesh Sundarban Delta. So uh, if we go with this nexus, already uh, Ritu talked about this nexus, uh, globally so if we go with this uh, that very uh, in, in our research, research study center study area so that uh, we should talk about that uh, what is the what are the climate stresses they are facing they are facing basically that uh, that the, that their uh, um, sea level rise uh, sea, level, sea level rising uh, flood cyclone and and um, storm surge uh, these are the these are the issue they are uh, they are facing uh, 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 the, and uh, as well, uh, not only that, uh, salt water intrusion is also another um, problem they are facing. Water logging is another problem. So these are the environmental challenges they are facing due to climate change. Okay, so this the, the, the same problem uh, exists in the Bangladesh as well as in the in Indian Sundarban. But now we can't, I come to the point that is the li what livelihood options they have right now. So. In both the deltas, in Bangladesh Sundarban Delta as well as in the Indian Sundarban Delta, the livelihood options basically they have two livelihood options. One is agriculture, and another is fishing. So both are natural resource-based livelihood option. So when they received any uh, any type of disaster, so they are basically they, are, they don't have any, no no other. And uh, in, in at the at the time of at the time of like uh, summer season. Uh, this agriculture basically based on this uh, rain-fed agriculture. So summer season, they are going to do some uh, uh, collection of non-timber forest product like honey, um, uh, bee works, like in that way. And uh, and in both the delta, we can see the same situation. But uh, why they are migrating, right? So if they have like uh, livelihood options, because when they are facing any disaster situation, then uh, they are losing everything, losing their houses, losing their livelihood livelihoods, and losing their uh, uh, aquaculture farm also if they have so this is the situation right now so that due to losing their livelihood they are growing outside they are migrating from their region so this is the situation this is the link between this uh, climate change and migration and if uh, like uh, and uh, where they are reaching they are reaching nearby uh, peri urban and uh, urban areas so uh, they are reaching peri-urban and urban areas as an urban slum, and they are facing a lot of problems. A lot of problems means they are facing, uh, they are fighting with the extreme poverty, they are fighting with the uh, uh, health hazard, they are fighting with uh, human trafficking and other other issues. So now they are coming into the point that how they are linked with this slavery. So if they're uh, like. We have seen, as far our uh, research, we have seen that that migration in the Sundarban Delta, specifically in the Indian Sundarban Delta, it's basically uh, 
both uh, push migration uh, and the push factor and pull factor both are working push factor means that if the climate change is happening the the climate change is pushing them to going outside and the pull factor the uh, in other part of the country or uh, the outside the country they are getting very much amount of wage so they are uh, th that that much of wage in the uh, southern india and other parts of india they are getting so this is attracting them so this is the pull factor so this pull factor and the push factor both are working for them and if we go with this like uh, when uh, when the when the disaster will happen then main main male person male person going outside in the indian sundarman delta so uh, the other other uh, other family member like uh, the women and children and the uh, aged population are staying at home so here the trafficking tra uh, trafficking agent will uh, started their operation so when the people going outside, when the male person going outside, male person is not there, male person is facing outside in the poverty and something like health hazard is on all. At the same time, their family is also facing their acute poverty situation. And at that time, the trafficking uh, agent will come and they will say that uh, uh, he can help them uh, to going out, uh, out of this poverty situation. And in that way, they are uh, uh, asking their family that uh, come to uh, come to with them, come with them and, and and they will take them and uh, sell them in the prostitution area and sell them as a bonded labor to the employer to the other 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 region so this is the situation in indian sundarban delta how trafficking how slavery is comes here and not only that uh, if if we if we come uh, if we if we if we like uh, human uh, trafficking and uh, there is two types of trafficking. I can I can say there is two types. One is the sex-based trafficking, and other is the non-sex-based trafficking. So we have already talked about the sex-based trafficking, that is prostitution, uh, selling in the prostitution area and all. And the non-sex-based trafficking, this is basically the different types of slavery. One, uh, I can say that uh, domestic labor, and I can say industrial labor, I can say uh, uh, some, uh, some, some marriage-related uh, 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 rackets, and so on. So, and if we if we come if we come to the point like if we go back uh, the, at the at the time of Isla like in 2009 uh, we have heard uh, we have we have already uh, talked about this uh, people in the Sundarban they said that at the time of Isla uh, there is a push factor comes in so if uh, just because of the climate change event they have to this is the forced migration they have to migrate from the other places from the region. So the, there is a forced migration, and at that time, the traffickers, at that time, that uh, trafficking agents are come come to their place, and uh, 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 only for the uh, woman and girl child. So that is the situation uh, when the traffickers, when the when the trafficking agents comes into the picture, and uh, how trafficking is continuing, and what is the relation between the climate change uh, gives us the migration, and how migration creates the uh, anti-slavery uh, slavery and, and and trafficking. So this is the this is the situation in, uh, and we have seen that uh, at that time uh, some of the area I can tell you that one thing that that at Sandeskali Sandeskali Kultali Gosaba these are the blocks community development blocks where you can see this, uh, the the high concentration of, of um, that uh, trafficking agent and, and and this type of activity uh, in, in case of Bangladesh that something little bit different. Uh, um, uh, I can say I can say that is a little bit different. That Bangladesh uh, only the weaker section, those who are staying in the vulnerable situation, vulnerable uh, places, they are only the they are, they are migrating to the other places, other other place of the country. And not only the other place of the country, they are sometimes they crossing the border to come to the India also. So and and and, and uh, if, since there is a, some immigration immigration restriction in all the countries, not only India, they are going some Gulf countries also. So, if, if there, if, since there is some, uh, or in many of the countries, there is some immigration restrictions. So, they are, at that time, they want to go uh, to go, going outside. They want to earn some money. They want to feed their family. So, this is the current situation of them. Them and uh, on the on that part, they are basically compelled uh, to rely on the corrupt group, corrupt, corrupt group of the uh, that uh, uh, trafficking agent. And and accidentally the. And they come to the place of the slavery. They come to the place of the uh, forced labor due to that uh, uh, that correlation with the corrupt agent, corrupt trafficking agent. So this is the situation. And the, I have seen that the main drivers of the Bangladesh uh, uh, slavery, or whatever I can tell you, that Bangladesh modern slavery, that uh, property loss and 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 loss of economic 
uh, other economic options, other economic opportunity are the main reason, main drivers for the uh, uh, slavery, uh, uh, I can say. And and if we, if we come to the like uh, trafficking, uh, who who are who are who are the major major uh, uh, they are they are at, at, uh, uh, at um, uh, we do we do we do are the main main uh, 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 agent for their uh, uh, in Bangladesh we do are the we do we do are the uh, they are uh, very much at the trafficking agents have started their operation in the disaster affected regions regions and and they are targeting basically widows. In, in Indian Sundarban, they are targeting women and girl child. In Bangladesh Sundarban, they are targeting basically widows. Uh, always, ob obviously, there are girl child also there. So, uh, so this is the situation. And 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 uh, uh, and uh, in, in Indian Sundarban, we have seen <coughs> two types of situation. And one is the uh, male person is migrating outside. At the same time, the trafficking is happening in their family. But in Bangladesh. Uh, situation is different like uh, trafficking there since they are, are uh, correlating since they are uh, rely on the corrupt groups and since they are uh, doing some uh, activity with the corrupt groups to to getting broken a job in abroad to getting going to abroad or something like in a in that way so in that way they are uh, in they are into the trap into the into the trafficking into the forced labor into part uh, this, is, this is the situation so I can tell you. I can tell you that that sometimes, sometimes in in, in Indian Sundarban, their their uh, uh, the 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 family, the uh, head of the family also uh, are in the group, are in the group. Their uh, family also uh, helping helping the trafficking agent to uh, sell his children or sell his wife, like to go outside to, uh, to earn some money in that way. So this is the situation. Um, of the, uh, this is the linkage. I can tell you that uh, how climate change creates migration and how migration, migration uh, go further like uh, slavery. So uh, this is the situation right now. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Somnath. And I think um, th there's a lot in that to, to unpack and understand. And I think, um, yes, it's um, it, it, it really does illustrate the human impact and the, the real life impact of of modern slavery and the intersections with um, climate change and migration. Um, I'm going to pass now to um, uh, James and Enoch actually to answer um, this next question um, in in tandem. Um, we, we we really would like to understand a little bit more. Um, about the Kayai and the, the, the enterprise that, that um, happens in, in Ghana um, of, of um, young women um, having a kind of role of, of porters carrying carrying things and, and understanding really what, what's occurring in relation to those women and um, often children being forced into situations of, of debt bondage uh, in, in Ghana. And how how does climate change act as a sort of stress multiplier in that particular context, increasing their their vulnerability? So give us give us a little bit of an insight into that case study that the um, research looked at. I don't know who wants to start first. Whoever's quickest to unmute, maybe James. This is different from uh, Zoom, so I'm struggling a bit to understand it. Okay, so uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this uh, research work. And I would like to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Enoch, who um, worked a lot with all of us on this project. Uh, the poverty situation in Northern Ghana is worsened by the unfavorable weather and environmental conditions, which are further worsened in recent years due to climate change and environmental degradation. Farmers in this zone, unlike in southern zone, have only one season of rainfall, usually from May, June to August, September, followed by a prolonged period of drought. Irrigation facilities are limited with the fuel drying up quickly due to high temperatures. In addition, rainfall patterns have become unpredictable both in occurrence and duration. Migration of people from northern to southern Ghana is therefore seen as a, an adaptation strategy to fighting poverty in the area. 
and also as a coping strategy to the single season of rainfall. While male migrants from northern Ghana usually work as laborers on farms and in mines, female mostly work as headquarters, commonly referred to as Kayaye. And you will see uh, this word coming through quite often. Kayaye is not an English word, but it's a coin word in the major cities of Ghana. The study found evidence that women and young girls working as Kayaye headquarters um, that Sky is usually referred to as headquarters, uh, become victims of modern slavery and work in slavery like conditions in destination towns. So we have some of the destination towns, such as um, Kumasi, Accra, Takrade, and other places. The Kaye has emerged to be an enterprise that now involves the use of deception to traffic unsuspecting young girls into labor exploitation. The enterprise usually involves an adult female at the destination town who receive unsuspecting young girls and pose as their guardians. In the end, these girls and young women become enslaved to their masters and would have and, and would have to work for them under exploitative conditions. These are usually older women who with businesses in the destination towns. They often create enterprises out of the girls, but pretend they are acting in their interests, profiting from the gullibility of the girls. Young girls and women engaged in Kaya usually do not have accommodation. They sleep in kiosks. Kiosks are very small uh, containers, um, usually meant for stores, small stores. Uncompleted buildings, and in front of shops, making them vulnerable to sexual exploitation and abuses. And uh, we um, we wanted to get this uh, particular case study. Um, a Salame, two, 20, 22 year old, is from northern Ghana. She has been working as a Kaye in Accra for seven years. And this is what she has to say. The decision to migrate to Accra was influenced by the lack of job opportunities in my village. Farming, the main livelihood is carried out by men, while women only support with their labor. My village suffered flooding in each of the past three seasons. And I must say that as I speak to you now, this flooding as record and in the last couple of weeks we are seeing a lot of flooding pushing a lot of uh, um, girls to the south farmlands were submerged and eventually destroyed farming is a good livelihood option but the cultural system and bad weather is destroying the crop it is no longer conducive for me and other young people, especially women, to earn a living at home. I use my earnings as a kayaye to fend for myself and support other family members, including buying food, maize, beans, and gari for them during the dry season. Working as a kayaye has not been easy for me. When I came here, that's in Accra, I did not know anything about the work. I was told that the woman providing our pans, the pans are the ones, the things that, um, the container that you use to carry the goose, um, will also feed us and give us accommodation. However, all my earnings go to her and only sometimes will she give me a small part of the money. I've earned uh, the money I've earned. Before you can leave her camp, you have to work and pay for the pan and also the accommodation she provides. So basically, I was not getting anything from my work, hard work. To make things worse, I dropped someone's items from the pan in the market for which I had to compensate. 
when they estimated the cost of the items, it was very expensive and not something I could afford. The woman who controlled me paid on condition that I work and repay that amount to her. I have been working endlessly and I have not been able to repay. So this is um, this is one case study and we have a number of them uh, that we, we could give. Um, Fuseni is from Northern Ghana. She is about 21 years and has been working as a KIA for about six years now. I migrated to Accra by following my friends when I completed junior high school and could not continue my education to the senior high school level due to poverty. At some point, food was becoming scarce uh, for my family, a typically large polygamous family in northern Ghana. I also observed that although her father and, and brothers worked hard on the family lands, they got far fewer food crops after harvesting as a result of the low and short rainfall seasons behind um, um, being experienced. I therefore decided to follow my friend to Accra to work as a, a kayaye so I could support myself, my mother, and also help my younger siblings, three of them, for further the education, uh, to further the education. When I first came here, I was like Farida or even younger, um, and then he was laughing. I was in group of other girls, mostly those from my hometown. I was new to the business, so sent, uh, so they sent me to one Hajia and told them I was their sister who has come to join them. They told me it was Hajia who takes care of them by giving them a place to sleep and also buys the head pan for them. So I got a new head pan, which I use for the work. However, at the end of the day, I have, I have to send my money to the Ajia as payment for the head pan and also for the sleeping place. I was not told the price of the head pan. I was just a small girl and did not know much. I did not know when I will finish paying too. So I worked for a long time and was never told anything. When I realized I was being cheated, I ran away from that group to another. So these are, you know, classical cases of how um, climate change effects drive young people from the northern Ghana to uh, the southern parts of the um, of the country, and then they fell they fall victim to slavery and slavery-like practices. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, uh, Enoch. Did you have any words to to add to that? I think we've got a few we've got a few minutes before we need to to move on to the next. Yeah. Okay. Please. All right. Thank you very much. Um, um, just to say that what um, James has presented is a clear demonstration um, of how climate change is a stress multiplier in 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 the in the context of the discussion that we are having. So it is clear from Ritu's presentation the three phases. You can see that although it cuts across um, all the three phases, but it is lightly situated within the second phase, where um, a number of factors, first caused by climate change, make uh, force people to migrate. And in the end, they find themselves in modern slavery situations, thinking that they are working and making a living. But because of their, their peculiar circumstances, they, they, they are exploited, and they basically cannot do anything about it. You can look at if someone is 21 years and has been engaged in career for like seven years, and you're looking at someone who was about 13, 14 years and, uh, of age, and to what extent can that person exercise agency? To what extent can that person be assertive before an adult and say that I deserve to be paid this amount? I ought to have this. I ought to have this. That cannot be done. So in, in the end, it, be, it, it falls within the visual cycle that was captured in the study and basically this is what we we, uh, we are presenting or we found in this um aspect of the study so this is what i have to say for now thank you thank you thank you enoch and of course if somebody's in debt 
bondage um, and that they're not realistically able to pay that that debt back. That is essentially uh, a form of slavery. They're forced to keep keep working um, whether they whether they want to or not. Um, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'm coming back to you now, Ritu, and uh, really asking us to sort of get down to, you know, the, the, the sort of business side of things, uh, if you will. Um, what do we want policymakers to do to, to address the issues that have just been outlined from, from Ghana uh, and, and Bangladesh? What, 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 what needs to happen? Uh, thank you so much, Jasmine, and a very important question. Um, and the three speakers before me, uh, James, Enoch, and Somnath, have very clearly illustrated the, the link that exists and that needs to be uh, prioritized, at least taken into consideration by policymakers. Uh, policymakers need to work out targeted action at national and international levels on how to address this issue, which is impacting the most vulnerable population. And, you know, we have, we had worked out within our report, a, a, a set of actions that policymakers need to take. And, and they lie on both sides of the, uh, of, of the table, like both on the anti-slave, not both sides of the table, but on both aspects, both on slavery issues, tackling slavery issues, as well as the climate change issues. And, and unless they are dealt with in a, in a coordinated fashion, uh, we will not see much results on the ground. So some of these set of actions that we have suggested for policymakers is one, to recognize this as a priority uh, in both development and climate policy and integrate these priorities and actions in urban and rural climate resilience plans. Almost every country is coming up with these plans. They now need to recognize this nexus within these plans. Also in migration response plan, they have to they have to acknowledge that slavery and trafficking issues exist and migration response plan has to address those risks as well and we also need to recognize them beyond the climate plans beyond the migration plans into the national development plans as as well the second area of action that we have identified for them is to allocate firm targets and actions uh, to be considered within the UNFCCC mechanism uh, for climate change and in line with the Sustainable Development Goals. Sustainable Development Goals, they recognize this issue. UNFCCC mechanism has not recognized this issue so far. Um, and, and I'm sure many of you would know that a task force on displacement uh, was created in line with the Paris Agreement uh, within, the, within the area of loss and damage to develop recommendations for integrated approaches to avert, minimize, and address displacement related to adverse impacts of climate change. Now, that's the, that's the purpose of this task force on displacement. Now, this task force on displacements, even though they have consulted both people who are working on migration, uh, on climate change, but somehow this issue of this nexus has not been included or ever discussed in any of their meetings, they need to include this issue within the action plan so that it can be considered uh, not just in their uh, in their support areas, but also within the framework of UNFCCC. The third action area that is needed is the is we re we require a coordinated international effort, uh, which is, and we are not saying create new initiative. We are saying this coordination needs to be rooted within the existing initiative. Currently, there are so many efforts which are ongoing on this issue. Uh, we talk, I just talked about the task force on displacement. There's SDG, there's Sendai framework, there's early announcing initiative, then there's a platform on displacement, disaster displacement, and so on. I can go on with a list of few more, which deals with these issues, but they're quite scattered across several sectors and different actors and they target different stakeholders. There's a need for a more joined up approach or a, with a more inclusive approach within these different initiatives so that it complements and draws upon the work of the existing bodies and expert groups to specifically deal with this nexus or this uh, the overlapping issues that exist right now that we have highlighted through these two case studies. Fourth area that policymakers need to see is that they shape these policy interventions. They, while I'm 
talked a lot about these international and national level action, but these policy interventions needs to be based on local level research and evidence, uh, especially addressing the risks of slavery in context of climate change across a wide range of national and local contexts where it may occur. It requires the need for a more for inclusion of those communities which are affected within the decision making and the openness to include local forms of resilience and adaptation. What they are currently doing, can we build on them and, and, and use that as an evidence to inform national and international policies and practices. The fifth area I would say is to integrate slavery issues within the nationally determined contribution. Right now, almost every country, they, they have started to revise their NDCs on climate change action. Uh, many of them have been submitted. But our request to countries would be the NDCs, they need to identify policies and actions for providing safe migration pathways, addressing vulnerabilities to trafficking and slavery in context of climate change. And to implement these plans, they can converge the existing development as well as climate finance. And, and, and we can always explore whether we can reach out to other parts of climate finance as well to address this nexus issue. Sixth area, I would say, would be the list is long, Jasmine, because the, the issue is very complicated. So the sixth issue would be to strengthen the social safety nets for climate risk management. In both case studies, we saw that you know, they're forced into pursuing these risky or dangerous coping mechanism that lands up, lands them into, uh, into slavery or trafficking like situation because they don't have social safety nets they can rely on. So when where vulnerability to slavery should be, I would say it should be considered within the way social protection initiatives are framed and even climate risk management frameworks are framed to especially create a rights-based approach for providing access to basic services, basic minimum services, and social safety nets when they are faced with these crises. And it could be, you know, of course, climate crisis, but even if you look at the current uh, COVID crisis, you know, our safety net really helps in supporting communities in a big way uh, to help them not feel as if they have been completely uh, you know, left to themselves, at least they have something to fall back on. And besides this, you know, something which has really gained traction with some policymakers, started to gain traction, is the issue of within the social protection program, because we are talking about migration and displacement, portability of these rights and entitlements within the social protection initiatives would become extremely important. Uh, because, you know, when they are moving, these migrants, and especially in context of climate change, when they're really pushed, just like Somnath was, say, was saying, explaining that they're push factors. Climate change creates push factors. And when the people are pushed to migrate, they should be able to carry this safety net with them um, so that when they are at destination site, they have access to those basic minimum services. And finally, I will close by highlighting the same point which Claire had highlighted in our opening remarks that preventative measures are needed and advanced planning to relocate and resettle displaced communities is really in need of the hour. Because, you know, there's so many figures we have we have heard since the event started about more than 200 million people expected to get displaced. So anticipatory action to move people to safety before disaster strikes can really help them help reduce their exposure to slavery. Not all situations they are, they are they, that leads to slavery. But if there are some chances of them getting exposed to slavery, this these advanced measures, anticipatory actions, will help in minimizing those risks. So I'll close there, um, Jasmine, unless you have any further questions. Thanks, Ruti. Well, we'll um, no doubt we come back to you shortly after um, uh, this panel, uh, when we get to the questions to the panel, but um, Fran, I know that at IID we're, we're you know super committed to um, continue working on these issues. Um, I'd really love to hear what um, the anti-slavery international's plans are to take the findings of this research forward, and what action points do you feel are particularly important that we should really be advocating for? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I think. Um, 
to start with, just recognising that organisations that traditionally work on climate change and environment and human rights organisations like anti-slavery have recognised that there's an issue that really hasn't been addressed yet by the international community is absolutely critical. And in the presentations, we've heard about the importance of bold action and the, about the fact that slavery is a bit of a blind spot in development circles. And that's something that we really need to address. So in tackling climate change, we need to be thinking about the most severe impacts of climate change on the most vulnerable communities. And to my mind and in the mind of anti-slavery, those are people who are in or vulnerable to modern slavery. Um, I think the fact that we can demonstrate that there's a nexus between climate change and modern slavery demonstrates the importance of tackling climate change at the root and doing everything possible to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees as a, as a first and important step. And that would be something that we would be taking to the climate talks or the COP in November um, in the in in Scotland, um, I think there needs to be an equitable response to climate change and human rights. So when people are and policymakers are thinking about what they need to be doing to respond to climate change, they need to be thinking about the human impact and who's being affected, and particularly on uh, thinking more fully about migration, climate change hotspots, migration pathways and responding to people who are vulnerable to modern slavery because of climate change. So my vision is that we begin to start to pull together a network of civil society organisations like our own, both in the global north and in the global south, building on this experience, uh, finding out more about where there is an understanding or an understood nexus between climate change and modern slavery in different parts of the world beyond the countries that we've already studied. Um, and to call out the international community, starting at the UNFCCC and with the climate talks, but also towards the World Bank, um, towards the G20, and asking for concerted demonstrated action um, from civil society who are witnessing on a day-to-day -day basis these devastating impacts on human, on human, the human condition and on decent, the right to decent work. Um, so from my point of view, if out of this research, we could begin to build a coalition of organisations and civil society who are interested in demanding urgent change on this issue, um, we would have done very well. And I would invite people who have joined the meeting today to get in contact if they'd be interested in taking that work forwards and helping us to shape how we might call for dramatic, urgent and bold action. Thank you so much, Fran. Um, very, very concise as well. So um, we do have some questions from the audience, but we are short of time. So if I could ask our respondents now to be quite concise. Um, but the first question is for you, um, um, Sunna. Can you talk about the social structures of the communities living in the Sundarban Islands? Have you got many Dalit or indigenous or religious minority in that region? And how would you suggest we address the power imbalances um, within those social structures in tackling these issues. Thanks. This uh, already uh, clear, a very good question. So uh, already we have that. Uh, already we have talked about this uh, social structure that there is uh, like socioeconomic structure. I can say socioeconomic structure that would be a good term, but maybe so. Uh, that uh, there are uh, most of the major major two livelihood options is uh, one is agriculture another is fishing so this is totally based on natural resources and social structure there uh, there are we have in india we have caste uh, situation there are brahmin there are uh, other castes also so and and in terms of in terms of indigenous population i can tell you there are santals 
we have indigenous population in Sundarban around 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 more around 10 percent of the population at uh, indigenous population. So if we go with the economic situation of a different uh, social category, like the, uh, in Sundarban, we have boat owners, we have hotel owners, we have agricultural family, we have uh, 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 fishing family or fishing farmer, whatever. So the, if you go with the economic situation that fishing or crab fattening or or or, or crab collection or uh, this 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 is the very very lucrative lucrative uh, uh, activity uh, for them because uh, annually they are getting around uh, 76 to 80000 um, uh, uh, inr they are getting and if we, if they are doing some agricultural activity uh, i can say one thing that 50% of the agricultural uh, 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 they are basically the agricultural worker they don't have any land 50% of uh, population they don't have any land also so they are basically the agricultural worker and and uh, I, they are they are getting annually around fifty thousand to sixty thousand money I, INR. So this is the economic situation and and other caste like other 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 status of the uh, population like boat owners and the hotel owners they will get some more money. And if if we come uh, already Ritu talked about the power uh, game uh, and there is the power game also there is a power game because uh, <clears throat> but how the trafficking agents comes into the picture because. Uh, there is a power game because uh, if uh, the 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 the, uh, the the news that the family is getting um, uh, having some problem in the poverty so the news comes from this maybe the some uh, some uh, 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 other other uh, other families so that that is the that is the case the power game the uh, the the persons who are sitting in the the top side of the economic situation so they are basically uh, treating these uh, poor families just like uh, uh, the regional slave slave po population. So this is there is also the power grain. There is also power grain. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thanks, thanks, Samath. I think it's very it's very useful to understand something around the, the 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 sort of power balances and the social structures. And and actually, similar questions come up for um, James and, and Enoch for us to understand the exclusion and the systemic oppression, the kind of historical discrimination that, that needs to be addressed in the context that you're, you're talking about. I wonder if one of you would like to just give us uh, sort of 60, 60 seconds on, on, on that. All right, so on the issue of uh, power balance and uh, the social structure, um, in Northern Ghana, the society is basically, and most parts of Ghana, the social, society is basically structured in such a way that women do not have, um, do not participate or participate or take decisions, especially relating to farming. And here is the case, the communities that these girls come from are mainly farming communities. The land belongs to the men. The men takes the decision regarding farming. Even if there are irrigation facilities for dry season farming, it is done by the men. The women only provide um, labor, and whatever happens is the sole prerogative of the, the men. So in this perspective, women and young girls are quite removed from decision making relating to farming. So when they reach a certain age, if you look at the, the quotations, most of them got to junior high school. That's a very critical moment of a Ghanaian child. Junior high school, transitioning to senior high school, your, where your needs become clear and your parents are unable to meet them, then they, they begin to work in order to uh, obtain these things, and then that motivates them or forces them to migrate, to migrate to their southern cities to, en uh, to engage in other activities that they can generate money to cater for themselves or their, or their families. Um, on the other aspect of um, exclusion and systemic oppression, I want to wrap up so that if James can come in. From this one, we can look at it from national perspective, even starting from the prehistoric, um, I mean, the colonial days, the British government had a policy of not providing enough infrastructure and education for the northern part of the country so that that part of the country will become the labor reserve of the country. So that is a bit of historic. And the recent post-colonial governments have not also been doing enough in terms of vision of job opportunities and infrastructure to, to, to support the development of the place. So if you look at Ghana, the, we have the five most underdeveloped are the five northern regions, followed by the central region where we are challenging high is. So this is just a, uh, maybe James can wrap it up quickly on this. 
I think Enoch, you you've um, touched on the most essential ones, and for want of time, I wouldn't want to say um, um, anything in addition. I mean, I think you have first substantially dealt with it. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. I think it's always um, e extremely important to understand the systemic um, challenges that there that there are. Um, and, and indeed to be able to look at those alongside this kind of multi-layering of, of climate change on top. Um, so we've got, I think, probably time just for one more question. I'm just whizzing through to see um, what's been being dropped in the chat, what we might be able to, to look at. I mean, a lot of the questions require almost a university thesis, I think, to, to fulfil uh, and to answer. But I think there's one that's come up here that, that's quite interesting, which is, um, listening to the drivers of trafficking and modern-day slavery, it seems that some of the UN anti-trafficking structures, such as the Palermo Protocol, which emphasises a law and order response, which of course is necessary, but is much too, too limited. Um, I wonder if somebody wants to share any, any thoughts on, on that. Uh, Fran, are you able to, to share some perspectives? Uh, yes, yeah, a few thoughts on that, I think. Um, I think it's absolutely right, obviously, that there needs to be legal frameworks to support people who are subject to trafficking. That's absolutely vital. But as the person who, who asked the question suggests, there needs to be a much broader response to that. Um, and the recognition that we now have that there's likely to be a vast increase in stress stress migration because of climate change um, means that we also recognize that there's likely to be an increase in trafficking as a result of that as people become increasingly vulnerable and um, so it's going to be really important to address address that specific problem and in, in order to do that, I think there need to be prevention strategies put in place, first and foremost, that enable people to um, understand their rights and also to be able to demand protection. Um, similarly, I think there needs to be efforts made to address some of the other existing vulnerabilities and inequalities that people experience so that they're stronger and in a better position to be able to resist trafficking. Um, and I think there's also a role to play for climate adaptation finance to support communities that are becoming vulnerable because of climate change to adapt to the impact of climate change where that's possible. Um, and then there are other elements I think that could be put in place like um, training and helplines for people who do become victims of trafficking to support them to claim their own rights. Um, so essentially I think that there's, we need to look at the push and pull factors that I think Enoch mentioned. So on, on the one hand, there are the pull factors, which is the, the people who are looking for labor that they can exploit, which can sometimes result in trafficking or modern slavery. But the push factors, and I think the push factor uh, for us today is one of the push factors is climate change. And now we're recognizing that climate change, when led on top of other existing vulnerabilities, can increase people's vulnerability to trafficking. So we need to be looking at both of those things as well as the legal protection that the, the person asked about. Okay, fantastic. That, that certainly sounds like the, the start of a thesis, um, but I think in, incredibly important to remember the push and the pull factors. We've got to be looking at both of those uh, and at uh, an, an international and a national and local level if we're going to stand any chance of having the right kind of uh, systemic solutions to, to slavery. Um, now, we were, um, I think, probably galloping towards, towards the end now, um, and I, I really would like to um, close, bring the panel to a, to a close, I'm afraid. Um, I'm just checking in to see if, um, if Cecilia is still with us, because as I understand it, 
she was called away halfway through um, by her minister. And so I don't think she's able to say a few closing remarks, but um, wave at me if you are in, indeed still here somewhere in the background, um, Cecilia. But um, I really would like to just thank um, all of our participants um, uh, in, the, in the panel debate. Uh, and but, but to sort of launch now into a, a few final words from uh, Philippe Gonzalez Morales, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants, um, just to kind of close us off before um, we, we begin to uh, say our farewells. So, Q Philippe. To produce this report and discuss it at this event. I hope it will contribute to create public conscience about the impact of climate change on the situation of persons in mobility, leading under extreme circumstances to more forms of slavery. As the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants, I make a call for a constant multilateral dialogue among states and international organizations, and also for the participation of the civil society thereby strengthening international cooperation in the detection and monitoring of security threats related to climate change, as well as the prevention, precautionary preparedness, mitigation and response capacities that must be provided and articulated in a timely manner on this issue. Migration can be a strategy for adaptation to climate change if it is carefully managed and supported by appropriate development policies and targeted investments. When the limits of local adaptation are expected to be reached, well-planned migration to more viable areas, whether internal or external, can be a successful strategy. For people to move to areas of low risk and increased opportunity, a strong enabled environment for migration is needed, supported by direct incentives such as training and job creation programs. Strategies that support internal migration must safeguard not only the resilience of those who move, but also that of those in the communities of origin and destination. Consequently, countries will need to take a proactive and long-term planning approach to include climate-induced migrants in overall growth and development strategies. Understand migration as a solution to climate change while offering opportunities for adaptation to the latter, all the components involved in the issue must be observed. We, we must abandon the idea of migration being understood as a last resort. States need to develop legal migration channels in the form of visas, humanitarian corridors, or the abolition of visa requirements for population in vulnerable situations for environmental reasons. In addition, it will be important that these measures are articulated with our strategies such as city planning, the development of public policies for social integration, education, health, among others. A holistic approach is therefore indispensable to achieve a solution on this matter and ensure that protection of the human rights of the persons in mobility and prevent them from becoming victims of modern slavery. As a recognition of the importance of this matter, my mandate is working in the preparation of a report on climate change and migration to be presented next year to the United Nations Human Rights Council. A public call for contributions to this report will be made soon. I look forward to receive such contributions from states, the civil society, international agencies, and other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And now if I could ask uh, Cecilia um, to say a few words on behalf of the LDC group. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, again, I thank you for providing a space, a space for us to discuss this very important issue. And as a final reflection, I think it is important that we bear in mind that we are talking about human lives. And after all kind of slavery and after all the colonization processes, we all have been through for decades. Uh, in the 21st century, we cannot let that happen. Uh, responsibility needs to be taken. I think the international climate community needs to accept the link between climate change and slavery and more. Uh, the international uh, community needs to accept the solutions to this problem that passes by funding adaptation properly. 
I once again, um, I, I would like to remind you once I had a meeting with donors and I, I, I was very surgical and I said, if you do what you have to do in future, you will not need to deal with LDCs anymore. So if we reflect on this, there are responsibilities, the funding for adaptation and from other forums and, and, and sites funding for development are important. Here, it's climate change. Adaptation is there. All of us can see that almost nothing is being done in what refers uh, funding, and there are no more ways to show that. It's all crystal clear. So responsibility needs to be taken for, uh, from those who knows they have the responsibility to do so. I thank you again all for this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Cecilia. And I'm glad um, your minister spared you uh, for a few moments just to give us those those final words. So I really I really just leaves me to say thank you to absolutely everybody who's been involved in this. Um, to, to Rita, thank you so much for the work that you've done in leading all of this through as the senior researcher um, on this work to Somnath, to James, to Enoch to Fran uh, and indeed to our keynote speakers um, and finally last but by no means least to my co-host Claire um, and I think we just really wanted to make the commitment from anti-slavery's perspective and from IIED's perspective that we're on this we're going to be working to um, continue to raise these issues and push them forward. Claire, can I leave you the final word? Oh, thanks so much Jasmine and just to say I'm delighted to see the number of people in the chat for this event, um, keen to stay engaged. I think it, there's clearly something here so we can all work together on really raising this up the agenda. So thank you all for joining us. And thanks Jasmine for a great partnership. <laughs> Bye all. <laughs>